What's up, biology students? Your benevolent biology teacher here. In today's video, we're going to talk about how the cells in multicellular organisms specialize and begin to perform specific roles and functions inside that organism. We call this process cell differentiation, and it all begins with these cells called stem cells. In mammals like us, this is where life begins. On this slide, we're seeing some of the earliest stages of human life playing out inside the female reproductive tract. This structure here is called an ovary, and this is where female gametes are made via meiosis. These gametes, called eggs, or more specifically oocytes, are released from the ovary into the fallopian tubes during ovulation. If the timing is right, sperm cells, the gametes produced by males, will fertilize this egg here in the fallopian tube. This fertilized egg, called a zygote, now contains a full set of chromosomes, 23 homologous pairs if we're talking about humans. As a result, this zygote contains all the genes necessary to build a complete human being, a full set of genetic instructions. As it travels through the fallopian tube, this zygote begins to go through the cell cycle, growing, replicating its DNA, and eventually dividing through a combination of mitosis and cytokinesis from one cell to two, from two cells to four, then eight, and so on. Eventually, this ball of cells that we call an embryo reaches the uterus, and if conditions are right, it will implant itself into the uterine wall, integrating itself with the mother so that the mother can nurture this developing organism using her own body systems. That's because this ball of cells has no body systems of its own. It doesn't have a nervous system, a digestive system, a muscular system, or any other systems. It doesn't even have nerve cells, or muscle cells, or specialized cells of any kind. All the cells that make up this embryo are completely generic and do not have any special functions or features. However, all of the specialized cells that make up our bodies, our muscle cells, nerve cells, skin cells, bone cells, blood cells, and so forth, all descended from an embryo just like this. So how do our cells come to take on these specialized roles? How do muscle cells become muscle cells, and what keeps them from becoming nerve cells? That's what today's video is all about. We call undifferentiated, unspecialized cells stem cells. These cells have the potential to become many different kinds of cells. As these cells divide and replicate themselves, they go through a process called differentiation, and it is through this process that cells are able to specialize and take on specific roles and functions in the body. Totipotent stem cells are the most flexible. They have the potential to become absolutely any kind of cell in the body because they are completely undifferentiated. Zygotes are totipotent cells, as are all the cells in an embryo up until that embryo reaches the 16 cell stage. After this stage, the cells in that embryo begin to differentiate and go down different roads of development. The outermost cells are destined to become the placenta a structure that nurtures the developing embryo by integrating itself with the mother's tissues. And that's all these cells are ever capable of being from here on out. The rest of the cells in that embryo will grow into a new human being, and we call these cells pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotent stem cells are still mostly undifferentiated. They can become any cell in the body except the cells that make up the placenta. As these pluripotent stem cells continue to grow, develop, and divide, they continue to differentiate and become more and more specialized and less and less flexible as the differentiation process pushes these cells down different developmental roads. Even as adults, our bodies still contain undifferentiated stem cells. However, as adults, these cells are devoted to a particular cell lineage and are somewhat limited in their ability to differentiate into different kinds of cells. We call these adult stem cells multipotent because they are still able to become several different kinds of cells, but they are no longer unlimited in this ability in the way that pluripotent embryonic stem cells are. For example, a multipotent stem cell might be devoted to the blood cell lineage. This cell has the potential to become any kind of blood cell, white blood cells, red blood cells, platelet cells, or cells of the immune system like B cells and T cells. However, these cells will never become muscle cells or nerve cells because they have already differentiated beyond their ability to become those kinds of cells. So this is cell differentiation, by which undifferentiated stem cells become more and more specialized. But what controls this process? What makes some cells go down one road while other cells go down another? 
Why do some of these cells become B cells while others become white blood cells? The answer to that question is gene expression. Remember, every cell in our body has the same set of genes, but different kinds of cells express different sets of genes, meaning that they make different kinds of proteins. These proteins perform functions that ultimately determine what the cell is capable of doing. If you think of our DNA like a library, it's not as though every single cell in our body needs access to the whole library. Certain kinds of cells only use certain parts of the library and express certain genes as a result. Some of the most important genes involved in cell differentiation and specialization are called homeotic genes. Homeotic genes are like the master control genes that guide the development of an organism. These homeotic genes code for transcription factor proteins that regulate the expression of other genes in that cell. And all animals have a fundamentally similar suite of homeotic genes called homeobox, or Hox genes. Different Hox genes are expressed in different cells, meaning that different transcription factors are produced in different cells. These transcription factors control which other genes will be expressed in those cells, and ultimately determine what those cells are capable of doing. In this part of our diagram, the color-coded bars represent the different Hox genes found in a fruit fly. In this part of our diagram, we see where in the body these different genes are being expressed. For example, we see that these three Hox genes are expressed in the fruit fly's head region, and the expression of these genes is what causes the cells in this region to differentiate and develop into the cells that make up the fly's head, and not its legs or its wings or something like that. Likewise, these two genes are expressed in the fruit fly's abdomen, and are what cause this region to develop into the fly's abdomen and not its head. Mutations to these genes cause our fruit fly to develop abnormally, and experiments have been done that result in fruit flies growing legs where their antenna should be, or a head where their abdomen should be as a result of these kinds of mutations. Plants also have homeotic genes, but not Hox genes specifically. In flowering plants, for example, a set of homeotic genes called the Madsbox genes control floral development in much the same way that Hox genes control the fruit fly's development. Cells that express only gene A are destined to become the sepals of the flower, while cells that express only gene C are destined to become carpels. Cells that express gene B can become either the stamens or the petals of the flower, but that depends on whether gene A or gene C is also expressed. Cells that make up the flower's petals express both genes A and B, and cells that make up the flower's stamens express both genes B and C. Whether we're talking about plants or animals, these homeotic genes played a huge role in guiding cell differentiation. Like I said earlier, all animals have fundamentally similar homeotic genes called Hox genes. Both fruit flies and fish have Hox genes, but the specific number and configuration of these genes differs. As you can see, the fish and the fly have all the same colors, meaning they have all the same Hox genes. But the fish has many more copies of and variations on these genes, and these variations mean that fish develop differently than flies as a result, and end up looking differently at maturity. Even humans have Hox genes. We are animals, after all, and they are fundamentally similar to the Hox genes possessed by fish and by fruit flies. As we can see, humans have multiple copies of some of these Hox genes, and they are arranged slightly differently. But just like the Hox genes in a fly control which cells become the head, and which cells become the tail, our Hox genes play a similar role in our development. Knowing how and why stem cells differentiate and specialize to do certain jobs and form certain structures in the body is of great interest to the medical community, because if we can learn how to control this process, we may be able to invent new forms of medicine to treat diseases and conditions for which we currently have no cure. The promise of stem cell research is nearly limitless, and although there's a lot left to learn, there's a lot of real promise to stem cell research based on what we already know. Stem cells grown in a lab, for example, can be used to test new drugs, medicines, antibiotics, and therapies. Suppose, for example, that we develop a new drug that is meant to treat and heal the liver. If we could control the differentiation of stem cells in the lab, we could force a culture of stem cells to differentiate into liver cells then test that new medicine on these liver cells in order to determine its effects. 
Likewise, we could test the toxicity of poisonous substances on these lab-grown cells in order to determine the effects of this toxin on different cells in the body. By studying how stem cells by studying stem cells and cell differentiation, we may one day learn how to prevent and correct birth defects and may also be able to grow brand new healthy organs for transplant into people with failing or diseased organs. Growing a new organ for a person is a practice called therapeutic cloning. Cloning in general is a controversial topic, but no matter which side of the argument you come down on, it is important to remember that unlike reproductive cloning, in which whole organisms may be cloned or copied, Therapeutic cloning involves cloning only part of an organism, something like a kidney or a liver or a heart, and not the whole organism. Here's how it works. Because every cell in the body contains all the genes necessary to build a complete human being, that means that a single nucleus from a single non-reproductive cell in an organism contains all the information you need to make a clone of that organism, and a clone is an exact genetic copy. To make that clone, you remove the nucleus and genetic contents from a mature adult cell, something like a skin cell. Meanwhile, you take an egg cell and remove its genetic contents, leaving all the cellular machinery behind with none of the genetics. Then you take the nucleus from the skin cell and place it into the empty egg cell. This egg cell now contains a full and complete set of human DNA, just like a zygote would immediately after fertilization. This cell is a clone of the person who donated the skin cell, or rather its nucleus, because it contains exactly the same set of genes as that donor. Give this clone a little shock to get it started, and that cloned cell will begin to divide. Eventually, it will grow into a blastocyst, a stage in early embryo development. This blastocyst contains a ball of undifferentiated, pluripotent embryonic stem cells, and if this blastocyst was implanted into the uterus of a human female, the ball of cells inside would continue to divide and would eventually differentiate into all the different kinds of cells in the human body. It would become a fully formed human being. But if we're talking about therapeutic cloning, that would never be allowed to happen. It is a fairly common misconception that therapeutic cloning involves cloning a whole person, allowing this person to be born, then killing this person and harvesting their organs, but that is simply not the case. This cloned embryo would be grown in a lab, in a petri dish, and the ball of pluripotent embryonic stem cells inside this blastocyst would be removed from the embryo before they were able to differentiate. With the right knowledge and tools, these stem cells could be guided to develop into any organ or tissue in the body and could be used to grow a new heart, or a new liver, or a new kidney that would, be a, that would be a perfect genetic match for the original skin cell donor. Even so, despite the potential for advancements in medicine, cloning and the use of embryonic stem cells in general is an extremely controversial topic. Not because human beings are being grown in labs, then killed and harvested for organs, but because the embryo from which these stem cells are taken could, under the right circumstances, grow up into a fully formed human being. It has the potential to become a person, and for some people that crosses the line. There is no easy answer to this question, no clear line in the sand that separates a real person from a pre-person, so it is up to us as individuals to draw that line for ourselves, based on what we believe is right and what we believe is wrong. People draw this line in different places depending on their beliefs, and there are those who believe that an embryo or fetus is not really a whole person until it is born, while others believe that it is a whole person as soon as the sperm cell fertilizes the egg cell. An embryo is, in fact, genetically human, but is it a person before it has a beating heart or a functioning nervous system? To some people, the answer is yes, and to others, the answer is no. And this is why embryonic stem cell research is a controversial topic, because embryos must be destroyed in order to harvest those cells, even if those embryos were never actually inside of a human being. As a result, embryonic stem cell research was made illegal a few decades back for any stem cell research except those on lines that already existed in labs. This meant that no new embryonic stem cells could be harvested, but research was allowed to continue if it involved embryonic stem cells that already had been harvested and were already being grown in the lab. But remember, adults have stem cells too. They're just more limited than embryonic stem cells. Whereas embryonic stem cells are pluripotent and could become any cell in the body, adult stem cells are only multipotent. 
They are not completely differentiated, but they are devoted to a particular cell line. For example, certain multipotent adult stem cells may be able to become any cell in the nervous system, but they are not able to become cells in the muscular system or circulatory system. Other multipotent adult stem cells might be destined to become some kind of muscle cell, but they would never be able to become a nerve cell or a blood cell. But despite their limitations, adult stem cells have an enormous medical potential. Moreover, using adult stem cells does not require the destruction of any embryos. These cells can be extracted from adults without hurting them or damaging them in any way. And for a lot of people, that makes it a little bit more palatable and a little bit easier to get behind. The research on adult stem cells recently led to the discovery of a means of reprogramming a multipotent stem cell to increase its potential, and scientists discovered that they were able to turn a multipotent adult stem cell into an artificially pluripotent cell that once again had the potential to become any cell in the body. These reprogrammed cells are called induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells. Harvested from willing adults, without requiring the destruction of an embryo with the potential to grow into an adult, these induced pluripotent stem, or IPS cells, have all the potential of a pluripotent embryonic stem cell, but with little or none of the associated controversy. This was a huge medical breakthrough. We recognize the enormous potential of IPS cells to improve the quality of life for many people. These IPS cells could be used like the embryonic stem cells involved in therapeutic cloning to grow replacement organs for people whose organs have been damaged or which do not function properly for one reason or another. We could even potentially rewrite the genes in the IPS cells to correct genetic abnormalities that result in disease and disability. These IPS cells could be given right back to the original donor, providing replacement organs and tissues that are a perfect genetic match for the donor, or could be used to grow new organs and tissues for another person, provided that doctors can prevent the body from ejecting these foreign cells. And IPS cells could be used to study disease and treatment options for that disease while being grown in cultures in the lab. Whether it happens in the lab or naturally inside an organism, cell differentiation guides generic, unspecialized stem cells through a process that ultimately leads to specialized cells that play specialized roles in the body. As the cells in an embryo go through the cell cycle, growing and dividing over and over again to produce all the cells in an organism's body, they also become more and more specialized and less and less generic. And this is the essence of what it means to be a multicellular organism. This process, which begins occurring early in embryological development, happens due to gene expression. And as different genes are expressed in different lines of cells, these cells begin to differentiate and take on specialized functions. Understanding how this process plays out is of great interest to the medical community because it has the potential to lead to a whole new world of medicines and medical practices that can improve the quality of life for people who suffer from ailments with no known cure. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks for watching, and remember, you can go back and watch this video as many times as you need until you feel like you understand these things called stem cells and the process by which they differentiate to perform specific functions. And, in case you need to better understand why these stem cells have so much medical potential.